723, that's where we are, what we've been looking at, what we'll be looking at for the next few weeks, because uh, it's a fantastic sound. And it starts off with a great sentiment, God is my shepherd, I shall not want, that's what we looked at the last couple of weeks. And we kind of concentrated on the second part uh, last time, but the first part, the first sermon, which is the Lord is my shepherd, so the most important thing to get from the whole thing is the Lord, who is the King of the universe, is not just our shepherd, uh, in the sense of the church as a whole, but he is my shepherd, he's your shepherd, individually and personally, which is really amazing when you think about it, that he would take the time to do that. Uh, so the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's how it starts now in verse 2. We're just whizzing along, and uh, verse 2. Uh, one time uh, a guy was preaching, and uh, he did this. He put his watch on the lectern, and this little boy was sitting with his dad, I ran the front seat and, and the kid said to his dad, Dad, what does it mean when the pastor takes off his watch and puts it on the lectern like that? And the dad said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to put my watch back on. Absolutely nothing. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. The second verse of Psalm 23 speaks to two of the most important needs that human beings can ever have. Number one is the need for provision, and the second is the desire for peace. Who wants to be at war? Nobody. Not even people who serve want to be at war. War is the last thing they want to do. Ask a service person. You may have enjoyed the fact of building camaraderie with your comrades and your brothers in arms, sisters in arms, but who wants to fight and die in a war? Nobody does. But sometimes we have to because of situations that we are in. But we have the need for provision, the need for peace. The I shall not want part speaks to our need for nourishment. He's going to lead us beside the green pastures. The uh, I shall not want for refreshment, if you will, is that he leads me beside still waters. And when we look at the first one, which is that we shall not want for provision, we are right in the middle of a supply chain crisis. We've got containers lying off LA and various ports in the States that can't get uh, landed. Uh, we've got a shortage of drivers, apparently, and so on and so on and so on. And so there's a chance that, you know, uh, whatever you ordered for your grandkids or your kids or your mom and dad's Christmas, I, I would, my suggestion is go to Dollar General and just get it done. Okay, because there's a chance that that fancy thing that you ordered from China might not make it. You know what I'm saying? In any case, we should be buying from China, but that's just me. <laughs> Buy America. <laughs> Don't get me started now. So the need for provision. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Something about sheep. I don't think sheep are as stupid as people make them out to be. No, they're not the, the most intelligent animal in the world. But they're not that dumb. But they've got some common sense. If, in fact, animals have common sense. If, they, if there is such a thing, then they have some. Because there's certain things that they won't do. And one of them to discover in a minute or two is that sheep are not that happy with running water. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, they could fall in. Right? They could fall in. So sheep are really up kinds of water. That's why in the Middle East, uh, shepherds do not lead them except to oasis, not to a stream but they will lead them to an oasis, or better than that, the shepherd will have his own well and draw water for the sheep and stick them in a trough like they do today and, and water them that way because sheep at least are smart enough to know that I'm wearing this big woolly sweater. And the wool gets really wet, and if you've ever dived into a swimming pool with your clothes on, you'll know what I'm talking about, especially if you get a lot of wool, and it tends to get really heavy when it gets wet. Back in the day when I was playing rugby, uh, they made all the, all the rugby shirts with cotton uh, and, and a kind of material. It, it, 
they do different things now. You know, shrink to your body like American footballers. But I remember playing rugby and these things and, and it raining like crazy. And that thing began to get real heavy. You know, you, you just, your uniform gets heavy. And so, and, but sheep have got all this wool. Here's an interesting thing. You, you ever put a sweater or like a woolen sweater in your wash and then it comes out and it's not the same size as it was when it went in? You ever done that? Uh, here's the, I don't understand that. Because if that's the case, after it rains, why don't sheep shrink? <laughs> I never thought about that. I mean, really? I'm not from around these parts. <laughs> I'm not a very agricultural kind of person, but at least I thought, I mean, that was a, that's a good question. Why don't sheep shrink? And that's the one thing you're going to take away from this message. You're going to forget all the biblical stuff I'm going to share with you and just walk away and say, guess what that guy said this morning? He thinks sheep shrink after a rain. So, what an idiot. Anyway, so here we are. Here the, the, here's the Lord leading us beside green pastures. And it's interesting that he uses that terminology because the Hebrew word for green there talks about new grass. It talks about something that's luscious. Not something that's gone through the whole season as now. If you go to Texas, you know, in the middle of July, there's no such thing as green grass unless you're pouring a ton of water on it. Our house, we get St. Augustine grass, which is a water hog, and you just got to keep pouring water on it. And then when you get one of these droughts that we've had in Texas, you know, many times over the years, then you know, the grass just gets browner and browner and browner. And you can't keep up with it. But the promise here is. I'm going to lead you always beside green pastures. I'm going to bring you to a place of abundance. Not just any old grass, but the best of stuff. Psalm 37 verse 4 says this. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Hold on to that for a minute. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. God's Provision for us is not just the get by provision, but it is more than that. Psalm 37 4 almost mirrors Psalm 23 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, I said this If the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The reverse is true. If the Lord is not my shepherd, then there's a good chance I will want. But the key part of the verse is, the Lord is my shepherd, not that I shall not want part. So we've got to get the order correctly. Psalm 37, 4, written by the same guy, says exactly the same thing. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. We always gravitate to the second part. Oh, I want the desires of my heart. That's the wants part. Remember we talked about the difference between wants and needs last week? Wants and needs? That's the what. What do I want? I want the desires of my heart. How'd you get that? Well, what's the first part of the verse? Delight yourself in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. What's the reverse of that? If you don't delight in the Lord, then maybe you won't get the desires of your heart. Is that logical? And so there's always a sequence of what God does. It's like, put me first, and then things will work out. Make me an afterthought, and then things might not work out. Delight yourselves in the Lord. No delighting, no desires. This is pretty simple stuff. I mean, it's, it's, you know, when we think about it, the problem is we live in such a fast-paced society, we don't take time to think about things like this and what the Bible says, and we just rush. Now, I've been in so many churches over the years where pastors have got there and, and promised people things that God hasn't promised. Just to make them feel good. I'd love to go out there and say to everybody, God bless you. But I can't. Because God does not bless everyone. Just because I say so doesn't mean that he'll do it. You follow that? Grace is given to us as a result of nothing. If 
we deserved grace, it wouldn't be grace. It would be a reward. If you deserve something, it's a reward. If you get something for nothing that you didn't do, in fact, if you did the opposite and still got it, that's grace. Blessings follow obedience. You can read it throughout the entire Bible. Look at all the ifs. If my people do X, Y, and Z, then I will do the same. I'll respond. Grace follows nothing. Blessings follow obedience. We've got to obey the Lord in order to be blessed. So be careful when we're throwing the blessings out there because I'm not sure God backs up every time we say bless you. Unless you're the Pope or something like that. You get away with it. Okay. David says, when he says, I shall not want, he's saying two particular things. He's saying there are, oh, there are areas in my life that only God can satisfy. Only God can fulfill. But he's made another statement, which I think is equally as important. And this is, this is it. He's saying this. He says, I've made a decision not to desire anything outside the scope of what God wants from me. Follow what I'm saying? I've made that decision to only desire those things that God wants for me. But here's the thing. We are so driven by our own desires. We want to feed ourselves. We want to, to be able to be the masters of our own destiny. So we're always attracted to things that seem greener. So here's the Lord saying, I'm going to make you lie down beside green pastures. And for many of us, that's not good enough. It's like, okay, I want greener stuff. I want the things this life can offer me. The problem is that, in a sense, we've become colorblind. We just don't see the blessings at times of God distance. We don't see it as green pastures. Because our eyes are somewhere else. Whether it's money or sex or self-fulfillment or whatever it is. For us it's always, what's the old adage? The grass is always... Yeah. Well that ain't always true. Because sometimes the grass is green on the other side of the hill just because they are set to tank growth. <laughs> so it's not always the case. committed to supplying our needs. Second thing he deals with in this wonderful verse is he leads me beside still waters. And that talks about the need for peace. Let me give you some statistics that you may or may not know. Human beings in the past 3,400 years have been at peace with each other for 268 of them. That means that 8% of recorded history is this world being without a war. 8% of the entire history of the world. Human beings, the last 400 years. Uh, 108 million people were killed in the wars of the 20th century, and they estimate overall around a billion people have died in wars that uh, since we've been making records. Billion people. U.S. has been at war 222 out of 239 years of whatever the stats are now. 20 years. This nation has not known some kind of conflict somewhere. And we can't even seem to live at peace. You realize that the U.S. made something like 500 treaties with the Native Americans over that period of time, and they broke Everyone. We talk about peace treaties in the Middle East, we talk about peace treaties here, peace treaties there, and we can't seem to make peace at all. International peace, let me just say to the best I can, international peace is never going to happen. Never going to happen. Well, when's it all going to die down in the Middle East? Well, it's not. According to the Bible, it's not. It'll never happen. 
if you've ever been, I've been in the Middle East quite a bit, Arab countries and Israel, there is such a depth of animosity. I remember talking to two guys from Hezbollah about their perspective of Israel. And I said to them, you know, give them all the options. If I gave you, you know, the, the entire nation of Israel is your, your capital, uh, or Jerusalem is your capital, and the Golan Heights and the West Bank and Gaza, etc., etc. And I asked them, I said, would that make you happy? Would that, would that be it? If you, you, you're masters of your own destiny? And they didn't know who I was. But, and so the two guys looked me in the face and said, no, we want every Jew to die. And I said, well, thank you for your honesty, because I know that's your opinion, but you kind of do the smoke and mirrors thing when you hit the news stations. But it is the intent to see Israel be wiped off the face of it. Don't, don't ever think it's not the intent, because that really is what the thing's all about. And that's never going to cease. And you can blame Abraham for that, by the way. So if we can't have international peace, what can we have? Let me tell you something that's even better than that, and that's inner peace. Jesus talked about that. He said, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Because what's wrong with world peace? Well, it doesn't last, does it? It doesn't last. It's there for a moment, and then it's gone. Conflict has ended. We've signed a peace treaty. Now we're all fighting somebody else. Or the treaty didn't work. Or somebody broke it. Or whatever else. Let me tell you something. When God makes treaties, he keeps them. When he makes promises, he fulfills them. When he says, you can have my peace, he really means it. And it really works. And I've seen it work. I'll get to that. Rejoice in the Lord always, says Paul. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and, conjunction, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That is a huge statement, folks. I could preach on that for about six months, but I won't. But it's important that we understand that. And the peace of God that transcends or surpasses all understanding. What does that mean? What, what does that mean there? We're talking about God's peace. We're talking about the one who leads us beside still waters. He comes along and stills the water. Remember, sheep don't like running water. And he comes along and says, I'm going to lead you not beside a, 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 a gushing torrent that makes you freak out. I'm going to lead you beside a still pond with green pastures so that you can just sit down and eat and drink and relax and be at peace. What is all that mean? Peace of God surpasses all understanding. Well, if it passes, surpasses all understanding, it means it's something more than natural. Right? It's beyond our ability to comprehend. It's a supernatural peace. But again, it's contingent. You begin to see the, the pattern. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You ought to make the Lord my shepherd, I don't want to be in want. Delight yourself in the Lord. And, conjunction, he will give you the desires of your heart. So you've got to do that first. What is Paul saying here? He's saying this. Don't be anxious, but in everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And, and you can put in brackets, as a result, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. Guard your thinking and guard your feeling. Now let's, let me close by just saying that I have seen that, and you've probably seen that happen in people's lives. At times where there is no way that that person should be experiencing any kind of inner peace at all because everything has gone wild, everything has gone crazy, maybe there's been bereavement, maybe there's been fights, maybe there's been whatever it is. And all of a sudden that person goes to the Lord and says, Lord, you're my shepherd. 
You're the one that leads me to sight still waters. I need to experience that peace that passes all understanding. And wham, all of a sudden, things can. And right in the middle of a situation where there should be pure panic or grief or whatever it is, there's that supernatural peace that comes from God. And it's like, wow, this actually works. If you've never experienced that, ask. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He shall give you the desire of your heart. And if that desire is for peace, that's what He will do. We are in a world that is coming apart. If ever we needed the peace of God in our hearts, it's right now. Otherwise, we're, our heads could explode. How did we get that peace that came through Jesus, that came through the cross, and everything else? Let me finish by this scripture. For he himself is our peace, who has made us one, who has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that's the law of commandments contained in ordinances, as to create in himself one new man from the two here, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God and one body through the cross, putting death to the enmity, and he came and preached peace to you, you, those who were afar off. What does all that mean? It means that God established peace through the cross. Peace with who? Peace with God. What do you mean peace with God? I mean, I thought God liked me all the time. Uh, no. If you're not a believer, uh, no, that's not true. The Bible tells us that when we are outside of Christ, we are, whether we know it or not, at war with God. We're rebels. We're not on His side. That don't make that real clear. And through Jesus, the greatest peace that we can ever experience is not international peace. It's not even that inner peace that makes us feel better when things are bad. It's peace with God. That the war between us and God has ended because Jesus has made the peace of the cross. And by us submitting to the will of God, the Lord's will. We're no longer, the Bible says, aliens and strangers, but we're part of God's will. That's the most important peace. Not just peace from outward conflict, peace from inner struggles, but peace with our Heavenly Father. That's the most important. Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful that the peace that we could not establish, you did. Lord, help us to realize the most important aspect of peace is that we are reconciled with you. There's peace in our hearts and peace with you. But Lord, I pray for those, Lord, who struggle with us. And I pray, Lord, they would know your peace in a supernatural way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.